Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the centenary celebration of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIEST Shipwood. Today, we are here for the 13th centenary lecture under the centenary lecture series by our honorable alumnus, Dr. Alok Majumdar. He would give his lecture on the topic, The Role of Numerical Flow Simulation in Space Exploration. Today's lecture will be chaired by Dr. Bijan Kumar Mondol, Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, IISD Shipwood. Sir, please take over. Professor Mondal. It was not. Okay, so good evening to everybody. So today's centenary lecture topic is the role of numerical flow simulations in space explorations. And it will be delivered by Dr. Olok Mojunda. And uh, it will be of 50 minutes duration as I talk to him. And after that, there will be uh, questions from the student sides and also discussion as questions from our uh, senior alumni. Uh, and before that, let me introduce Dr. Mojunda. So first of all, he's a, an ex-student of this institute, that is E-College, which is now IIST Shipwood. Dr. Mojunda currently works in the Thermal and Combustion Analysis Branch in Propulsion System Division at NASA. Marshall Space Flight Center, Alabama, USA. He got his bachelor's degree from B College, B College in 1967 in the Calcutta University. And in 1969, he got master's degree from the same institute. After the joint Central Mechanical Engineering Research Institute, that is CNERI, which is Durgapur, and he got his uh, PhD from the University of Bhadwan while working at CMRI. After that, he moved to Imperial College London for as a postdoctoral fellow. He joined there in the heat transfer sections. In 1980, he moved to USA and final uh, and worked in aerospace industries and finally joined NASA in 1999. Dr. Mojunga pioneered in the development of finite volume procedures for the flow modeling of thermofluid systems, which he has incorporated in the generalized fluid system simulation program that was a, some sort of software, which is now widely used in NASA, different aerospace industries, and academia for the analysis of liquid rocket propulsion. In addition to that, Dr. Mojunga is conducting regular class training classes on this GFSSP and he has also taught the graduate and undergraduate courses in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Alabama, USA. He is the recipient of the NASA Software of the Year uh, Award and NASA Exceptional Engineering Service Medal. He has published a large number of research papers in different reputed journals and conferences and also book chapters. In addition to that, he presently holds three years patents to his credit. So now I request Dr. Mojunda to start his lecture. Thank you. Sir, please unmute. Can you? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Am I audible now? Oh. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Mondal, for your kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank um, Professor Asok Mollik for his recommendation to include me in this distinguished uh, lecture series, and Professor Sudip Ghosh and Bidut Pal for all their help to arrange this talk. Uh, it is a distinct honor to speak in the centenary celebration of mechanical engineering department 
uh, from where I graduated in 1967. It is a privilege at the same time, it's a challenge to be on the stage after so many distinguished speakers uh, illuminated uh, the audiences uh, with outstanding speeches. So uh, I'll not try to compete, but I'll try to share two stories with which I'm familiar. The first part of the story is about uh, space exploration. Uh, I'm not going to talk about a you know um, detailed um, space exploration. I'm going to only talk about a few uh, NASA programs, um, uh, particularly emphasis on the propulsion system, uh, which is really the focus of um, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, where I have been working for the last 30 years. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about the development of numerical method for flow simulation. Uh, this is a journey which I started at B College um, during my master's thesis. I pay tribute to uh, late Dr. Pandapal, who has introduced me to this fascinating world of fluid mechanics and heat transfer. Uh, in my lecture, you know, in, 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 in a very brief uh, time I have, I'll touch upon a few um, breakthroughs that has helped the uh, numerical flow simulation possible to analyze a very complex um, machine like uh, rocket engine. So, uh, finally, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the work which we have been doing at Marshall Space Flight Center uh, to support um, the space programs. I have prepared this lecture mainly for undergraduate students who have taken basic thermofluid dynamic courses, uh, but I have something with, uh, sure. Share your screen, actually. Now our screen was being shared, so kindly share your screen again. Oh, okay. I'm not, I have not shared the screen yet. Okay, I see. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, can can you can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's go to the second slide. Uh, so these are the two topics I'm going to talk about. Uh, first topic, as I mentioned, it will be a brief history of space explorations with the emphasis on uh, launch vehicle. I'll start with the um, Sputnik program in 1957. Uh, to present days when NASA is doing the Artemis program. Um, and of course, I'll talk about the space commercialization. And in the second part of the talk, um, I will start with a, a little description of how a liquid uh, rocket engine uh, works um, and then what are the numerical challenges. Then I'll briefly um, go over uh, uh, the development of uh, methods which starts with the hydrodynamics to computational thermofluid dynamics which is practiced today. So uh, the space race really uh, start, uh, started in 1950s um, uh, between the two nations, um, USA and Soviet Russia, uh, during the Cold, Cold War. And the Russia took the uh, lead uh, in the beginning by sending first the satellite Sputnik and then the first human into, into the space. Um, of course, USA tried to catch up uh, by, you know, creating a NASA, which stands from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So soon um, USA, um, got over the race uh, in the Apollo program. They, they have been able to send man in the moon. And uh, after retiring the Apollo program, the space shuttle uh, took the center stage for almost 30 years. And the space shuttle retired in 2010. And since then, NASA is developing the space launch system. And of course, um, one of the highlights of today is the private companies are are in the space, um, are in the development of the uh, 
uh, space exploration. So Sputnik, uh, uh, with the Sputnik in the in 1957, that kind of a dawn of the space exploration, a two feet diameter um, satellite was launched for the first time, a man-made um, object and uh, rotated the earth for, um, for, for three weeks. And it was propelled by a, a Lox kerosene engine. That's the beginning. And then uh, in 1961, Yuri Gagarin uh, was the first human to uh, to orbit the Earth uh, just for one time. I mean, it's, it's 108 minutes flight duration in about seven, seven and a half feet diameter capsule. Uh, of course, you know, uh, USA wanted to catch up with so after passing the Space Act. NASA was uh, created just one year after the Sputnik was launched uh, in 1958. Uh, of course, space program was going on, and the f first U.S. satellite, uh, uh, Explorer 1, um, was in 1958, only just after four months after the, of the, after the Sputnik. Uh, Alan Seifert was the first um, uh, U.S. Um, uh, um, astronaut uh, flew in 1961, which is only a, uh, only after a month after Gagarin went. But uh, this flight was uh, just a kind of a 15 minutes flight, uh, went to the low Earth orbit and, and came down and uh, no orbiting. Uh, first orbiting was done by really John Glenn after some time. But 61 was a um, highlight of, of space exploration. This is the year when President Kennedy made that um, pledge that to, to send man in the moon and bring it back before the end of the decade. And so Apollo project started uh, in this year. So the heart of the Apollo program was uh, development of a rocket. And, and this rocket was developed right here in Huntsville, um, under the leadership of Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was a German scientist who, um, who was the developer of the V2 rocket in, during the Second World War. Uh, Werner von Braun and his team, you know, came to Huntsville and, and, and developed the space program, rocket, rocket research program. So he was the man behind the certain Saturn rocket, uh, which has got three stages. The first stage uh, run by um, yeah, Lox kerosene engine. Uh, kerosene is also called RP-1, uh, the rocket propellant one. So if I say RP-1, that's nothing but the kerosene. So that was the, um, a very powerful engine, eight million pound of thrust. Um, uh, and the second stage was run by um, LOX hydrogen engine, uh, and the third stage also by the LOX uh, hydrogen engine. Um, so the uh, 1969 was the uh, was the first Apollo mission, and there were six successful lunar landing between 1969 to 75, and the Apollo program um, retired after six launches mainly because of the two reasons. First is the cost. Uh, it costed $50 billion in 2020 dollar. And also by that time, um, USA kind of a winning the race. So they, they decided to uh, come up with a cheaper uh, a launch. And at that time, you know, reusability was the issue that, you know, so the first reusable engine was developed for the space shuttle. So um, just to give some of you who do not know too much about the space shuttle, and the, the space shuttle is um, powered by three engines, um, um, LOX hydrogen engine. And, um, and instead of using the kerosene, um, um, uh, they use the solid rocket bo a booster. So that goes for um, two minutes, and then this is jettisoned and collected from the ocean. And the space shuttle continues for eight and a half minutes to the orbit. And this is what you are seeing, the external tank, which is the, which carries the uh, liquid 
hydrogen and the liquid oxygen. So, um, so, um, so Space Shuttle operated for almost 30 years, 135 missions. And there are six orbiters um, there. Um, and it uh, launched numerous satellites, uh, launched and uh, repaired Hubble Space Telescope, many interplanetary probes, participated in the uh, shuttle MIR program. MIR is the um, Soviet space station, and mainly it is used to construct the international space stations. And it carried 22 space lab missions. But, uh, but Space Shuttle was um, had some disasters. You know, there are two accidents, and uh, we lost two orbiters: Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003. And although it was um, designed to have a you know cheaper space flight, but it was very expensive: uh, 209 billion dollars in 2010 dollar. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the main challenge was uh, was the uh, reentry, and if you see that there are um, thirty two thousand tiles are there um, uh, to protect it from the high temperature from the reentry. But after each flight, almost seven to eight thousand tiles were damaged, so they had to replace that one. So the cost of that uh, space shuttle was um, was very significant, and although it was reusable, but still the refurbishment cost was so high. And uh, NASA decided to um, drop that uh, program, and uh, after the construction of the space stations and. Uh, when to come for it. And another reason for abandoning the uh, space shuttle was its design. This offline design uh, was the cause for the two accident. You know, um, the Challenger accident occurred because um, there was a, a leak of the um, solid rocket booster uh, and, uh, and exploded the hydrogen tank. And the Columbia accident was uh, happened during the during the return uh, because of uh, one of the tile was damaged um, during the liftoff and uh, and that um, so it did not have the thermal protection and that's the reason uh, columbia disintegrated so both the uh, accident co was caused because of this offline design so nasa went back um, to again to the apollo design so only exception is that instead of using a kerosene engine, now um, space shuttle program uh, has developed a solid rocket booster. So the solid rocket booster was used uh, again. You know, it's, it's much cheaper than the LOX kerosene engine. So that so that is some um, cost saving, and then of course uh, the space shuttle main engine. Um, uh, uh, well, well, it will be used uh, for carrying the co stage. So uh, this time, um, uh, NASA wants to make a more permanent uh, stay in the moon. So what they're going to, in the Artemis program has got, you know, three, um, three components. Of course, the development of the most powerful rocket, uh, which is space uh, launch system. And then there will be a, a, a space station uh, which will move around the moon. That is called the Gateway program. Um, uh, from the Gateway, uh, uh, there will be a regular service to the moon, and that is called Human Landing System. So there is a sp spacecraft which will bring astronauts um, back and forth between the Gateway program, and the space shuttle uh, SLS will feed this uh, this Gateway. So there will be continuous presence in the moon. To develop a laboratory and uh, performing uh, many experiments. So the other part, um, exciting part, is the commercialization of the space. As I mentioned, that uh, NASA retired the um, space shuttle program in 2010, and at that time, uh, USA has no capability to send um, man in the uh, space station, so they had to uh, depend on uh, Russia's souls uh, to operate the space stations until um, in 2013, SpaceX came up um, 
with the Falcon rocket, uh, which is being used um, regularly uh, to, you know, um, service the space station. Um, but it is not just the Falcon rocket. Falcon rocket is the reusable rocket, uh, which is um, uh, which is a kind of a landmark development. Uh, as you can see, this is not the picture of the um, launching. It is the picture of um, a rocket is landing on the on the ground. So, um, so you use the the rocket which. Uh, which takes you uh, out of the gravity, and when the um, core stage function is done, then you use the rocket to come back smoothly to against the gravity, so that you can land uh, smoothly on the ground. And SpaceX has been able to do that. You know, uh, 106 times they have been able to successfully land the rocket either in the ground or even in the ocean barge. And um, 83 times the reused rocket was launched. So that is really the real uh, um, uh, cost saving. Uh, and, uh, and other companies has also coming up, Boeing, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, they have also developed reusable launch vehicle. So that kind of a, you know, concludes my first part um, of the talk. Um, uh, now I'd like to uh, talk more about the uh, uh, numerical development. Uh, uh, one thing I'd like to mention here that during the Apollo program and uh, for the space shuttle program, uh, there have been very uh, little use of the numerical simulation because it was not available. So all the um, design decisions have been taken by experiments, and that was probably one of the reasons that it is so costly. Uh, so, uh, of course, you know, you cannot fly any rocket without doing the testing. But before doing the final testing, there are many, many um, um, small uh, tests are done that cost a lot. Uh, but now uh, with the advancement of the numerical method, there are a lot of tests can be eliminated and that is, uh, uh, that is a big cost saving. So first I'm going to talk about, uh, to give you an idea about the functioning of the liquid rocket engine, the, the challenges, um, and then of course the uh, challenges of numerical flow simulations and how uh, we have um, made some breakthroughs uh, so that, you know, we are capable of uh, doing uh, the numerical calculations. And finally, I'm going to talk about the network flow simulations method that we are developing at Marshall Space Flight Center. So uh, first I'd like to, you know, uh, give you um, talk about the functioning. You know, when you see the uh, firing of a liquid rocket engine, you mainly see the fire and smoke. Uh, but you do not see what is behind. Uh, uh, what is really behind is a thermodynamic cycle, uh, very similar to the Breton cycle, which you know we have all learned uh, in our um, uh, undergraduate thermodynamics. So um, here is a. I'm going to show you two cycles. One is the simpler cycles, which NASA has used for uh, mostly for the Apollo program. Um, but in the space shuttle program, they have used a more advanced cycle. So let's talk, first talk about the gas generator cycle. Uh, first thing, what you have to do, you, you, you carry the fuel, and, and first thing, that, uh, that fuel has to be raised to a very high pressure. Like, a, you know, in the tank, it is stored at 40 PSI, but, uh, but the turbo pump makes it about, you know, 5,000 PSI. So how you do that one, you, uh, you burn a little bit of, you know, um, uh, well, uh, and run a gas generator that is used to drive the, the, the turbines. And uh, the, that turbines drive the, actually the pump, those two centrifugal pumps, one for the fuel and one for the oxidizer. And then you take the exhaust and you use the exhaust for cooling and the nozzle uh, because it is relatively cold now. And the rest of the uh, fuel, you burn it in the main combustion chamber. And that's what you really uh, see um, as the fire and the smoke and giving you the thrust. And, and this also gives you a little bit of thrust, but not much. 
So uh, this is a cycle which is not very efficient. Um, so more efficient uh, cycle has been used into the uh, space shuttle, which is called the staged combustion, where you um, uh, you is a two-stage combustion. So 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 you take some of um, hydrogen and burn with the oxygen, and you get a mixture which is rich in oxygen, um, and then you use that. Uh, combustion product to drive your turbine and then uh, then, then you, uh, still it has got a lot of potential because hydrogen is there so you, you bring that hydrogen back and uh, and burn it in there and another thing you, you use is the uh, liquid hydrogen you use the to, to cool the uh, nozzles uh, one of the thing is the temperature uh, a, a, for the hydrogen oxygen combustion is about 6000 degree Fahrenheit, whereas the um, um, stainless steel melts at 3000 degree Fahrenheit. To see how much cooling you, you really have to do it uh, to, to, you know, um, to, to, to make your um, nozzle working. So, so the cooling is very important. This is what the regenerative cooling. So there are many, many challenges, but I don't have time to talk about um, everything. So I'm going to pick up something uh, on the um, on the turbo pump. Turbo pump is a is a very complex um, um, component, um, and I'm going to talk about that. You know, so some of the issues how we use the numerical method to, to design a, um, a rocket engine turbo pump later on. So um, this is the uh, special main engine. Um, I don't want to go into the detail of that. Just I wanted to mention here and that you know we have got two turbo pumps here um, because as I mentioned that you have to uh, take the pressure from 40 psi to 5000 psi. So you really need uh, a low pressure and the high pressure tur uh, turbo pump. And this high pressure fuel turbo pump is probably the uh, uh, most complex and powerful turbo pump. Here are a couple of you know um, incredible facts about the space shuttle main, main engine, which you might be interested to know. Uh, first of all, that this is the first reusable liquid rocket engine ever built, and it uses the stage combustion cycle. And here are a few incredible facts. You know, the temperature range in this engine starts from minus 423 degree Fahrenheit, which is liquid hydrogen. And when it burns, it goes to 6,000 degree Fahrenheit. So you can think about the challenge of the material engineers and to, to um, uh, what kind of thermal stresses it can go through. And the other thing is the high pressure fuel turbo pump generates 37 million horsepower, which is equivalent to 13 Hubert dam. And it's the one seventh size of a locomotive, but you know, high pressure fuel turbo pump produces the power of 28 locomotives. And it has an incredible power density. A typical automobile engine produces half horsepower per pound mass. And space shuttle main engine produces 70 horsepower per pound mass. So that tells you, you know, how, how complex uh, this. So uh, changing the gear right now. So from the liquid rocket engine, I'm going to talk about uh, the fluid flow. And the fluid flow is, um, I know many of you probably not familiar with the Navier-Stokes equation and you don't have to, I just bring this equation just, just to show you uh, some of the complexity um, for which it was not you know, solved for, um, for many, many years uh, until we have a high-speed computer to do that one. So uh, f first of all, Navier-Stokes equation is nothing but you know, uh, Newton's uh, law written for a fluid flow. Uh, it doesn't look very familiar because it uses a um, Eulerian system. So when you write the Newton's law in an Eulerian system, that's what you um, you get, you know. And uh, um, so basically you have got the three momentum equations, which are uh, Newton's law in, in three directions. And of course, you also have to have a continuity equation because one of the things is different in a fluid flow that you solve the equations for a control volume. In a solid mechanics, you solve for a particular, you know, a particle, uh, an object. But here, there is no object. You have a control volume where millions of fluid particles can uh, come and go. So that's the reason you had to use a um, Eulerian system. And 
that brings this non-linearity. So non-linearity is a kind of a mathematical term, but physically it means that, you know, um, uh, fluid velocity at a certain point is depends upon the fluid velocity at a neighboring point, and that makes it a non-linear and complex to, uh, to, uh, to analyze. And another thing is that, you know, it's a coupled by the pressure, you know, uh, all three momentum equations has got pressure. So, um, so, so it's the pressure coupling, that's what we'll have to account for. And the third thing is the second order. This is a second order equation because of the viscous effects can be represented only by the second order. So because of these three complexities, uh, although equations have been developed in, in, in you know, 1850, um, but uh, there was no way to solve these equations. However, you know, mathematicians, they always try to uh, find a solution. So if, if necessary, they will make the simplifications. So they made the simplifications by bringing some concept of a potential flow. So the, so the potential flow, you know, I don't want to go into too much details, but just to try to explain you that potential, there's the potential function. If you take a derivative in the x direction, you get the u velocity. If you take a de uh, derivative in the y direction, in the v velocity. And if you introduce that, you can eliminate the pressure coupling and also they neglected the second order term. So now they have got something uh, which they can solve it. And they solved that equation. Um, um, but of course, that's, that does not show the reality. Uh, there, is a, um, um, there is a distinct departure uh, from the reality. So this is what, you know, uh, if you have a potential flow solutions, that's the streamlines looks like which means that the pressures at the leading edge and the trailing edge are the same. Uh, that simply means that there is no drag, and that is known uh, as D. Lambert's paradox. And D. Lambert was a mathematician, but he still uh, realized that uh, this mathematical solution uh, is unrealistic. So, uh, so this is how the D. Lambert's paradox reads, for incompressible and inviscid potential flow, the drag force is zero on a moving body with constant velocity related to the fluid. And that means that you can keep a cylinder there and the flow will go around the cylinder and you don't have to hold the cylinder. It will be just be floating. So that is a completely unrealistic. So, um, so, so this is the reason <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that engineers really abandoned what is hydrodynamics and the potential flow theory. And uh, they came up with a subject called hydraulics based on uh, laboratory experiments. And here you can see that um, uh, distinct um, uh, departure from, from the reality. Uh, in, in the streamlines are not attached, streamlines are separated. Um, so um, uh, so what is what is really <clears throat> hydraulics or experimental fluid mechanics? Uh, so you know, um, the engineers decided that, well, we'll do some experiments and uh, come up with some empirical relations, and that will be used uh, for um, for the design. So uh, I'm just going to talk about just one simple example. Say if you have a flow and heat transfer in a pipe, and the pressure drop is a function of the uh, length of the pipe, diameter of the pipe, the velocity of the pipe, and the friction factor. So by doing careful experiment, you know, uh, you can come up with the correlations uh, in terms of the Reynolds number. So which means that you can do a very small scale experiment, but you can use it for, um, um, for, for any, you know, any size equipment. Um, so that was the Colebrook equation. And similarly, on the heat transfer, uh, you know, the heat transfer from wall to fluid can be expressed as a very simple, like, a, you know, product of heat transfer coefficient area and the delta T. And the heat transfer coefficient is a function of Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. So, so these empirical correlations were the basis of the design for hundreds of years, and it is still being used like that one. Um, so it took almost um, 150 years uh, to, um, uh, to resolve the DL Lambert paradox. And it happened because um, of the, um, discovery um, of Ludwig Prandtl of the boundary layer. Um, the, the idea was that, well, if you have a high speed flow, you can neglect the viscous uh, effect, um, uh, but that's not true. Viscous effect um, 
will be always there in the very thin boundary layer. That's what uh, Prandtl um, discovered. And then it, um, it explained um, the uh, dl Lambert paradox. Uh, so what happens is this boundary layer really separates. You have got a large viscous region because of the um, viscous dissipation, the pressure will be lower at the trailing edge than at the leading edge, and that's what you have the drag. So, uh, yeah, although we know this uh, D.L. Lambert's paradox was resolved, but um, but still, uh, we did not know how to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, and. Uh, uh, the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation was really done um, uh, at Imperial College uh, during the 1970s under the leadership of Professor Brian Spaulding. And uh, I had the distinct honor of working in uh, with him uh, in my postdoctoral work. So, um, uh, so Spaulding's contribution, uh, there are a couple of contributions. First of all, he is the... Um, He's the, um, he has the concept of the, brought the concept of the finite volume method. So what is finite volume method? Um, um, earlier, uh, uh, people used to use the uh, Navier-Stokes equation and make a Taylor series expansion and get the algebraic equation and, and solve the algebraic equation. Uh, but he came up with a, a little bit of different. He said that, okay, you know, don't start with the, um, with the differential equation, start with the control volume because and, and and try to come up with a conservative form of the equations for the control volume. So, uh, the general transport equation, uh, which is essentially consists of three terms: one is your transient term, another is your uh, convective term, and another is the diffusive term, and that is any source term. So, all uh, this phi can can represents. Um, Either if it's a velocity, it becomes a momentum equation. If it is a uh, enthalpy or internal energy, it becomes an energy equation. If it's a concentration, it becomes a spacey conservation equation. So this general form is very helpful, you know, when you are uh, trying to um, solve a coupled equation. So that general transport equation, uh, or when you uh, apply in a control volume, you can come up with a algebraic form of the equation, so which means that this particular uh, point is connected with all its neighbor, east, west, north, south, um, up and down, and then uh, and this and these coefficients are essentially uh, the represents all the transport, like your convective transport and diffusive transport, are are all included into uh, into these coefficients. Um, so, so th that is really a, a remarkable, you know, achievement, um, and and that has been is being used in all um, commercial codes right now. What you have all been using, fluent flow three D. Um, but another thing is probably the most important thing came up. Uh, uh, that was, of course, you know, Shuhas Patankar and Brand Spalding uh, developed this simple algorithm. Uh, which is a, a very innovative algor algorithm where uh, the momentum equations uh, has been substituted into the into the continuity equation to develop a pressure equation because uh, the, the pressure linked equation the solving the pressure is a big issue so that has been possible and that is heralded the really the CFD revolution I don't have the time to go into the details of the simple algorithm but uh, but I just wanted to mention here that how uh, how much it contributed to the emergence of the computational. So now I'm I'm coming to um, you know, what I'd like to talk about the flow network analysis. Um, although you know the um, Navier-Stokes CFD is very important to do a very detailed study uh, for a component, but when you come like a system like this, which is a you know um, a very complex flow network uh, with you know different pipes and valves, a pump um, and a tank. You you, you wanted to solve this uh, uh, these things. You know you wanted to know the pressure and temperature and the flow rate at each component of this system. Uh, Navier-Stokes is not the not the solution for that. 
<clears throat> because it's almost impossible to you know resolve all these components into the three dimensional and you solve it, it it's just a uh, just impractical you know we have uh, not, neither we have a method neither we have a computer to do that one so uh, so for system level solution and and if your stocks is, is 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 not the answer so you know in fact computational fluid dynamics can be divided into the two basic categories one is the navier stokes analysis and another is the network flow analysis so i'm going to talk more about the network flow analysis because that's what um, we have been doing at marshall for the last 25 years so again you know navier stokes can you can have a finite volume finite difference finite element method most of the navier stokes are really finite volume based and uh, network also you can do either finite volume or finite difference but uh, we have chosen finite volume to develop this uh, generalized uh, fluid system simulation program. I'm going to talk about that in the rest of the lecture. So, so what is finite volume based um, method? Finite volume based method is uh, essentially an extension of the control volume method. Uh, in, in undergraduate thermodynamics, um, we all do this control volume analysis. Uh, but we, um, uh, we, do, we do the, you know, the basically we do the um, conservation of mass and the energy um, and because we we assume the flow rates are known when you do the thermodynamic analysis for a control volume typically we do a single control volume we just represent this as a boiler or turbine or or pump uh, and we just wanted to um, apply the first law of thermodynamics to, um, to to calculate what we don't know uh, the network flow is an extension of this control volume. Now you have got multiple control volume. Each node you can think about a control volume and each node is connected by a branch. And in thermodynamics we assume the flow rate is known but in real life you don't know the flow rate so we'll have to solve the flow rate. So it's a computational thermofluid dynamic problem. You have to do the mass um, um, energy as well as the momentum conservation equation. We have to solve all of this. So typically what we do, we take a fluid component and discretize it into the node and the branches. And you have got two types of node. One is the boundary nodes where you know everything and the internal nodes where you'll have to calculate. So uh, pressure, temperature, concentrations, they're all calculated at the node by solving um, mass energy or species conservation equation and you solve the um, momentum conservation equation in the branch so that's the idea and um, um, so how you do uh, um, what is your mathematical closer you have to have uh, equation for each of the variables you need to know the pressure uh, so who is going to give you the pressure uh, the mass conservation equation flow rate who is going to give you the flow rate momentum conservation equation fluid temperature you need to solve the energy conservation equation typically that gives the enthalpy and your mass conservation gives you the pressure so once you get the pressure and the enthalpy uh, you call a um, thermodynamic property program they will give you all the properties including the temperature uh, if it is a problem where you have got um, uh, the, the solid temperature i mean that you have to have a uh, solid to fluid heat transfer so for that you need to solve the uh, conduction equation um, to, to, to get the solid temperatures and if it's a mixture you have to solve the specific uh, con concentration equation and if it's a uh, unsteady problem you really need to calculate the resident mass and, and use the thermodynamic equation of state. So, you know, all these equations, they're all coupled equations, so you'll have to um, go through iterative process. Again, I don't have time to go over the uh, numerical method uh, in detail, but, uh, uh, but there is a special method uh, which we developed to solve all these equations. So, um, so here is the um, um, program structure. Uh, 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 it essentially consists of the three modules. Uh, the one module is the graphical user interface. Uh, that's where you um, and users spend most of the time uh, develop a, a, a flow circuit. It's just a kind of a drag and drop. You have got all the components, you know, uh, internal node, boundary nodes, and the branches. You drag it and and, and, and you create a flow circuit. So that's what you, you typically do uh, under this block. 
And then um, uh, when you run the program, what it really creates an input data file, um, uh, which the solver and the property module reads that data file and generates all the equations. How many equations depends upon what is the, um, what is the circuit, how many um, nodes you have, how many branches are there. That will determine how many equations you have and it generates all these equations. It solves the equations in conjunction with the fluid property program. And then, you know, uh, output it. So uh, many simpler problems can be done in this loop, but you know, there are also user subroutines. If you have um, more complex problem where you wanted to introduce new physics, like, you know, condensation model, heat transfer model, nonlinear boundary conditions. So uh, user can uh, have a, um, their subroutines. So these are kind of a um, bunch of, um, and blank subroutines, they are called from the source program um, and it is called at different places. So depending upon what you want to do, you can um, put your coding and um, and you can enhance the capability. So here it shows a, a simple um, a water hammer problem. So uh, this is the inlet and these are the pipes. You are discretizing it and here is the valve which you wanted to um, 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 close suddenly. Uh, so so th this is the physical picture of that. Here is the tank and it's a long pipeline and here is the valve. So you can you can construct this uh, so, um, circuit very easily and then you can get this water hammer signature. So now I'm going to uh, show you a few examples. As I mentioned that the um, uh, that um, Turbo pump is one of the most complex um, component um, of, of a rocket engine, and here I'm going to show you a, a turbo pump which has been, you know, designed, developed uh, at um, at Marshall, and which is eventually taken by the SpaceX, and they are using this in the in their Falcon rocket. So uh, during the development, um, um, uh, we uh, we wanted to analyze this. So what are the critical um, issues here? So here's the um, picture of the turbo pump and turbo pumps are typically driven um, by the um, by a turbine um, and it, the turbine and they're all in a coaxial shaft and so here is the fuel pump here is the LOX pump and, and driven by this turbine so typically as I mentioned that uh, fuel pump operates at a you know 3000 or 4000 psi pressure and whereas turbine probably operates in you know um, uh, 100 or 200 psi. So there is a big pressure difference, and all these pressure differences cause a big axial thrust, which which is taken by these bearings. So you know, designers wanted to know what is the axial thrust. To 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 get the axial thrust, you will have to know the pressures at all points. So that's the reason you wanted to have a you know, a network flow analysis to give you the pressures. Uh, at all points. Now there are some other issues that are also there. Uh, you have a fuel here, you have a oxidant here. You don't want to get them to mix anyway uh, in the turbo pump. So for that, you know, what you do, you inject a high pressure helium here, and the helium goes on the towards the fuel uh, and have a mixture of the fuel uh, and helium, and that is vented out. And also on the side. It, it may mix this with the locks and vent it out. So you got a kind of a um, seal here, which is called interpropellant seal. So you wanted to make sure that works um, during the operation. Uh, the other thing you wanted to do is to that in cryogenic um, um, turbo pump, you use the cooling of the bearing only by the propellant itself. So you make some controlled leakage from the impeller, uh, impeller outlet and you try to cool this bearing. So um, basically you have to uh, make sure everything works. So, uh, so, uh, so the purpose was to kind of, a, you know, uh, discretize this, you know, this is the helium uh, injection in the interpropellant cell, and this is a mixture of helium and kerosene. This is a mixture of helium and uh, um, helium and oxygen. This is pure oxygen, this is pure fuel. Um, so that's how we do analysis, and of course, you know, we, we had to verify this before we designed. So we did some testing and compared with the test data. So this is uh, one example, uh, and the other example I wanted to show you is uh, uh, that um, 
again, it is kind of related to the turbo pump uh, because when you design the turbo pump, uh, you wanted to make sure that there is no cavitation. So, um, uh, so, so supplying the fuel at the right condition uh, is um, is very important. So, what is it is done typically? So here, here I'm showing the uh, firing of the fast track engine in a test stand. Uh, so you have got the oxygen tank and this is a kerosene tank, and you pressurize both the tank with the, with the helium. And the the idea is you pressurize to send it to the turbo pump and the other thing is to um, make sure uh, propellant at the right condition so that there is no uh, cavitation. Um, so um, we developed the complete uh, circuit here. So the helium comes in here, part of the helium goes to um, uh, actuate the engine um, valve and then uh, another part comes to the oxygen tank, another comes to the fuel tank. So you um, basically you develop a um, a model of the entire um, um, uh, entire pressurization system. So most part is helium, but then uh, in these nodes we are really pre presenting the tank. Uh, so node fifty four represents the haulage, which is the is the vapor space. That's where helium is pushing the propellant here. And this node represents the propellant. So while it is running, this volume is expanding, and this um, this volume is reducing. Um, so the intent is um, to maintain the pressure within a certain band, um, and there is a pressure control valve which does that one. When your uh, pressure exceeds a certain value, uh, you, you close the helium supply. When it is reduces, you open that one. So it's a kind of a on and off valve. Uh, you wanted to make sure that it is always in this uh, uh, band to, to to you know avoid uh, cavitation in the in the tank. So we ran the experiments and we compared with the test data. So once it is verified, you can you can use it for for actual uh, analysis. Um, the I wanted to show you one more example um, uh, when you deal with the cryogenic. The um, it is um, uh, when you are wanted to fill a tank with the water, it's not a problem because uh, uh, because when water goes to the pipe, um, the pipe temperature and the water temperature is not much difference. But suppose if you wanted to uh, send a, a liquid hydrogen uh, through a pipe, uh, which is at an ambient temperature, and you can see what happens. Uh, liquid hydrogen immediately flashes to the vapor. So um, and and of course you know when it flashes to the vapor, it takes the energy from the um, uh, from, from the solid, so it, it gets um, chilled. So uh, you, you have to do it for a while until uh, the temperature of the uh, wall becomes equal to the saturation temperature. Now liquid hydrogen comes at minus minus 420 degree Fahrenheit. And this is at 80 degree Fahrenheit. So it will take some time uh, before your wall becomes minus 420 degree Fahrenheit when you'll be able to flow um, liquid at a constant rate. So this is a big problem um, for the, in the cryogenic transfer line. How long it will take to chill down the line? How much propellant you are, go you are going to lose um, just for the chilling? So there are some experiments done in the NBS back in 70s, uh, which we used to uh, to validate our modeling. So here, here you have got a 200 foot pipeline, and um, and there are several points. The temperatures were measured, and this this contains either liquid nitrogen or hydrogen, and you wanted to uh, um, get the uh, uh, get the data uh, for. Um, uh, for the temperature history. So when we build that uh, in GFSSP, uh, we discretize the whole tube into the fluid node uh, uh, and then all the walls into the solid node. And there is a connection between the solid to fluid so that you can account for the heat transfer between the solid to the fluid. So we did this work uh, just because we wanted to do a um, more complex problem. So we just uh, verified um, um, by comparing with the, with the test data. So one of the things is that how long it takes to chill down time. 
we compare with the test and the measurements. It's a fairly good, and this is what is more important to us. And of course, the temperature profiles we also do. Uh, there is not a very good uh, comparison, but uh, that's because of the heat transfer correlations are a little bit inaccurate here. Um, um, I don't want to go into all the details because we don't have time to go into those details. But uh, um, but still, uh, we feel uh, since the um, chill down time is computed quite accurately, we can use this to real uh, to solve a real life problem. So here is a one real life problem. I, I wanted to show you what we are showing here. The um, uh, aerial view of the, um, 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 the, the launch complex from where the space shuttle Apollo all are launched. So th this is where the uh, space shuttle is sitting here. So this is the picture of the space shuttle here. Um, and th th this has to be, uh, the, these tanks needs to be filled uh, with the propellant. So the upper part is the oxygen, lower part is the hydrogen. So, but uh, those storage tanks are, are located almost quarter mile away. So these are the storage tanks. This is the hydrogen tank and that's the oxygen tank. And, uh, and these quarter mile long lines are all vacuum jacketed. Uh, I, I forgot to mention in, in the previous uh, <clears throat> work also, the lines are usually vacuum jacketed because, um, um, because that's probably the most insulation insulated line if you create a vacuum um, um, uh, uh, that will reduce the or eliminate the heat transfer from the ambient because ambient is still you know 80 degree fahrenheit and and in the pipe you are sending um, um you know minus 420 degree fahrenheit for hydrogen and minus 300 degree fahrenheit for oxygen so uh, so, so this is a long line um, um, uh, and so, um, one of the things we wanted to do really to develop a um, a, a timeline, you know, um, how long it will take to, to to fill up the tank, you know. So for that, we need to develop a model. So that's what we uh, did. Uh, <clears throat> That's what we did. Um, so uh, this is the cross cross country pipeline, and you see we don't really uh, uh, use too many uh, too, too many nodes. Uh, <clears throat> it is a quarter mile long line, but we are just using only you know um, seven or eight. And, um, and the main thing is that you account for the correct length and the volume. You account for all the solid mass. Um, and then when it comes to the tank, <coughs> uh, you describe the tank here, and this is the uh, tank wall, and that represents the insulation, and that's the ambient. So the you still, you know, calculate how much heat is going to come here. Ultimately, you know, uh, this is going to the flare stack, uh, the, the hydrogen. Um, because all the vapor which is going, you are easily burned into the flare stack, and and the purpose is to fill the tank. So again, the you know the, the this is the, um, the test data, and that's the prediction. So it's uh, we get a fairly good um, a good agreement uh, between the test, and that's how we validate our model, and we can um, run and give the um, designers all the informations that is necessary. So uh, that is really uh, all really I wanted to show you today. I hope I have, uh, I'm within the time. So I just wanted to finish by saying a few uh, remarks here. Uh, so in early space programs, in all critical design and operational decisions were made by testing models and full-scale hardware um, because we do not have any availability of the, um, of, of the computing method. Uh, but now we are doing it. We are doing um, uh, many, many uh, analysis uh, through the uh, through competitions and making some decisions. Uh, however, you no know, testing is still needed. Uh, but we are definitely reducing its number, and the cost of the program is getting reduced. 
So, you know, um, of course, we are doing many, many Navier Stokes calculations also. When it comes to the question of the flow between the um, turbine blade, you know, definitely you need, you know, uh, Navier Stokes solution for the uh, for the fidelity of uh, that. But there are many situations where network flow course can be used, particularly for when you are trying to predict the whole system, uh, whole duration um, of the launch. Um, but the only thing is that the accuracy of the uh, network flow code codes depends on the empirical correlations. So there are many correlations that are available, but particularly for the cryogenics two-phase flow, still there is a need for developing more empirical correlations. So we are we're doing a lot of experiments with the help of the universities. And also we are trying to see that in, a, in some situations, even the Navier-Stokes simulation, can give us some correlations like, you know, friction factors and heat transfer coefficients. So that's the research is currently going on. So uh, I think uh, that's all I uh, wanted to uh, tell you today. And thank you so much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any question. Let me get out from the presentation mode here. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mudundar, for your nice talks. So you have shown us that <clears throat> basics of CFD and fluid mechanics, which is known to someone known to us, and also the high end application of this in space shuttle, etc., which is not known to many of us. Anyway, so now uh, I think uh, we'll go for that question answer sessions and the discussion sessions. So the students who who wants to work in this area of CFD. Uh, so if you have any doubts or any questions, you can ask first. And after that, we'll have more discussions about senior alumni is there. So now it's open. Okay, in that case, I think the students are taking some time to realize and to frame the question. So, I will ask uh, Professor Amitabh goes to initiate the discussions. And the students can send me an email if they have any questions later on. I'll be happy to answer any question. Yeah, yeah. I'll request, you know, a bit to, to, to share my email uh, with them. If they have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. I know that, you know, th th there's so much materials I, I get talk, yeah. talked there. Yeah. It may yeah. take yeah. Time. Yeah. Pull up, pull up. so much material. This will take some time to digest the whole thing. It was an extremely detailed and very technical talk Allah has given. An excellent talk. Thank you, Amit But I think but I you think need I... an expert in the area of fluid mechanics and heat transfer who will be in a better position to ask any questions. Yes, yeah, so. Um, uh... Uh, let me just uh, know something about now, uh, say 20 years or 25 years back, so uh, at least in our country, so we are used to uh, this uh, Navier Stokes equation and all this, everything, just to uh, wrote the programs for that using simple algorithm, etc., and run to get the results. But um, I think now uh, we have this time that writing program which will be suitable for a PhD or even MTech thesis is very difficult because that was so simple at that time. I mean, the problem that we handled, like say, your classical problem of differentially heated cavity, heat transfer problem, then your diffusion frames with simple kinetics. So that could have been written, but now it is difficult or it's time consuming and sometimes it's really very difficult. So what is your suggestion? So will, will the student uh, uh, spend time on uh, writing the code or they will use the commercial software that is nowadays available in 20? Uh, yes, uh, you're right, Professor Mondol. Um, uh, during our time, you know, if the students don't write any Fortran program, 
to solve the navier stokes equations or similar equations they don't get any credit so they yeah. uh, but but the things have really changed uh, nowadays um, uh, it is not very productive really for the students to um, start um, um, writing the code from the for scratch because the commercial codes are available you know what we have done here at nasa uh, we have uh, um, of course you know anybody who is uh, uh, working on a government contract they get this code free of cost uh, but we have decided that we have made an educational version uh, of the uh, of the code and that we distribute free to any universities. So many, many university students are using this code and they're doing, you know, uh, master's thesis, PhD thesis using this code. And we, we help them. Um, um, we have got uh, video lectures for, uh, so, so they, they have been using, and I'm surprised to see that the, how quickly they, they pick, it, pick it up um, uh, the code. And uh, similarly, you know, some of the commercial codes are also making it available. But the thing is that they, they are very expensive. Uh, many, many universities cannot use that one. So, but if it's a NASA code, we give it to, to free. So um, my, um, my answer to your question is that uh, I would rather encourage the students to learn a code and then focus on its application and and you know, still they have the lot of opportunity to add physics uh, to this code. And one thing we have seen that if the students get you know um, accustomed to using the commercial codes or the codes which industries uses, um, it is uh, it is very advantageous for the industries to hire those students really. So, um, um, so sometimes, you know, we uh, uh, have seen here the companies tell that, you know, uh, if, you ha if you already know the fluent, ANSYS fluent, uh, uh, you will be preferred. So if the students use it in the, in the thesis, it's, um, it will be preferable. Yeah, that's what we are doing. So we are uh, asking them to use uh, ANSYS fluent for the heat transfer and fluid flow problems. I just, I've got some, uh, another, uh, not a question, rather. Now, you went there, uh, I think in 70s you worked, isn't it, in Imperial College? Uh, mm -hmm. At that time, even that book, which you always uh, referred, there is a book by Patankar was not released. So no. what, uh, what was, uh, what is your experience at that time, working on CMD? Yeah, that was a tough, because I remember when I, went over there uh, they, they gave me this you know uh, 5000 line code and just the paper of patangar and spalding that's all i have <laughs> and and we are given a problem so we had to spend a lot of time but fortunately uh, what happened in spalding's group there are at least when i was there uh, there are about you know 10 or 12 graduate students and there are some postdoctoral students so they usually help to to, uh, to train the, uh, the the newcomers um so uh, so we had to we had to learn that was a really hard hard thing you know and then uh, of course you know nowadays i have not seen the students um wanted to do that one because they are so much exposed to this um uh, i mean canned software they don't want it to get into those types of details which we are which we did that one but you know the uh, age has changed now um, so um, the, the, now probably, you know, what we did um, 50 years back, uh, probably no students will be doing that. Uh, so um, I think um, uh, I think the code developments are probably now uh, done by a very small groups of people uh, in the in the industries and um, um, they don't use the Fortran, um, of course, you know, they, um, so the students um, really, if you ask them to develop the code from the scratch, I don't think it, 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 it's a practical, uh, it's, it's not practical anymore. Can I, can I say something? Bijan, yes. can I ask yes. something? Yes. Can I, Bijan, should I say yes. something? Can I? You permit me to ask a question? You are permitted, sir. You are permitted. Well, 
वेल डॉक्टर अलोक मजुमदार थैंक यू भाई इट इज ए वेरि वेरि दिस but there are two aspects i like to make my question clear one is uh, we have seen in other fields i am comparing with other fields that unless you do not understand the fundamental laws guiding the thing then using the code and available uh, uh, programs only does not give you an understanding of how things are happening this is my first uh, statement and the second statement is when uh, you are handling this uh, flow network flow problems in your own way is it only for the fluid that flux uh, fluid that you are using or there are uh, tweaking things there are the additional uh, elements in your developed program where it can act for any future fluid that could be used as a uh, as a medium for yeah that, that's a very good question uh, unfortunately no i really did not uh, get you know uh, opportunity to talk a little bit more details what really we have uh, we have integrated a uh, three um, computer programs uh, which is the thermodynamic property programs and each thermodynamic property programs comes with a, a, a number of fluids like one of the programs we have got called gas pack which already have about 39 or 40 fluids there so what uh, user can select hey this is my fluid and user can also select you know the number of fluids if it's a mixture you know often we had to have a mixture some of the examples i showed you that well it involves helium oxygen and hydrogen so uh, yeah, so you select um, all those fluids and what it does it, it creates a, if there is a mixture then you know your properties will be a function of the uh, mixture concentration and for uh, but of course you know what you said that you know whether it can be done for any fluid well uh, it can be done for any fluid as long as you give the property of the fluid so if if you have come up with a fluid which is not in the library of the code yes the user can use it they say that okay i'm going to provide the property of the fluid for that so which means that you know the user has the responsibility of providing the thermodynamic property table and the code can read it and then use it so it is possible for any fluids uh, as long as uh, you know the property of the fluid is that the, the, is that yeah, answer really question really very clear answer but there are first part is left which i'll come but i have got a secondary oh yes i'm sorry I, your first yeah, part yeah, was yeah. that the fundamental understanding let me tell you that's a very difficult question to answer when i uh, teach um, in the university i tell my students okay you are using this code but you know if you use it as a black box you don't get any really any understanding so what i normally do i ask them to develop a very simple program um like for example you know uh, 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 maybe a blow down a, a blow down of a tank which is a very simple program uh, and i i ask them to i i usually give them the algorithm uh, this is the this is the way you can solve it because sometimes students really does not know the numerical method you know the engineering students they may not know the numerical method so i usually give them a uh, algorithm and i tell them uh, to write a code in any language because earlier i used to say, i know fortran but you can write in any language you can write it in matlab you can write it in excel but but do that one so at least you get a feel of you know solving the coupled equations and what is involved to get a you know numerically stable solution so i always emphasize that you need to do a very simple problem to get into that one but that's the only thing you can do you really still cannot ask that hey you write the whole program uh, yourself you know uh, 
but at least you i mean that's my recommendation to you know most of my uh, my colleagues here that um, uh, that you know try to um, uh, try to learn it the basics of the things and i I completely agree with you, Achyuddha. If you do not have a good understanding of the physics, uh, uh, then you will never be a good analyst. All of How much? You, have, the... you have answered beautifully, but then it comes to a philosophical part of my question that in our profession, in anybody's profession for that matter, there are two parts. One is that physical drudgery, another, there is a fun. There is a great fun in the profession what you are doing and the fun comes from understanding the I mean, not the flow your flow is flow from understanding the flow of the work how it is happening how physically things are happening that part i don't want any people we doing the frontal uh, frontal face of science frontal face of physics to miss that part that is a fun in life yeah, I mean, um, uh, my advice to all the students who are watching here, uh, I'll tell them that, you know, try to enjoy the work, whatever work you do, you need to enjoy the work from the bottom of the heart, and then your life will be, you know, much stress less, you know, <laughs> you'll be probably avoiding all the stresses if you if you start loving your work. Yes, yes. It is not work with quantum mechanics where you don't understand <laughs> what you can work. But this is physical mechanics where you, one has to understand. Anyway, that was interesting. I had oh, look, I tell you honestly, not that I have understood all your all portion of your lecture. Something went beyond my head. But in general, uh, it was quite interesting, fascinating talk and such a large subject such a complicated thing. Whenever you mention that you mix two or three gases and then put the input, I got shut. I was shuddering. My God, what will be the complexity of the program? Anyway, those parts are left to the experts themselves. But for me, I'll tell you, though I did not understand everything, but I enjoyed the way you presented the very very difficult subject very difficult at least to me it's a very difficult subject but it was put in a fashion where one can appreciate the thing thank you bhai. thank you Ajit, achuda for your nice words i i'm happy that you enjoyed Bijan, can i ask a question uh, yeah hey, Olok, there are so many textbooks on cfd i mean on so many courses and so many textbooks on CFD, which emphasizes mostly the Navier Stokes part. This network flow analysis part, uh, are there books with some chapters on it? Or you want to write or whatever it is? Because this is something which I don't think is covered in any course. I think Olog has to write a book on it. <laughs> no, me, me. I don't know. I'm totally ignorant. I'm just asking the expert. <laughs> I am there there are books which contains this as some chapter to introduce that this is where Navier Stokes ends, and the network flow analysis, like in <clears throat> undergraduate, we did, you know, uh, hydraulics water pipeline analysis. How much water from the source will be distributed into different civil engineers do it more than mechanical engineers. <laughs> yeah, that is that is called Hardy Cross Cross method. Um, um, the, the but the Hardy Cross method is very limited. You can do it only for incompressible fluid. You cannot do the heat right. transfer. So for, right, so. that is only for water. I'm saying for right. the compressible right. fluids and mixtures and all these kinds of things. The special points which are necessary for the network flow analysis, which are not discussed in basic fluid mechanics, which are not discussed in computational fluid mechanics. So whether That's there true. should be some chapters on these topics also beyond and others experts who you know teach and uh, write books on these things should think about it that's my suggestion i have written a chapter you know recently um, uh, um, there was a, a publication on uh, ab about spaulding's um, um, 90th uh, 90th birthday uh, uh, oxfai runchal who was really a professor at uh, iit uh, probably ashok you know you know oxfai so I know, Akshay, I know him very well. Yeah. So, so Akshay edited a book and I contributed a chapter on network flow 
uh, it was published by um, by Springer Springer Barleg. Uh, but I I I had an intention to write a book, um, um, but you know I do not know when when that will happen. Uh, maybe after my retirement. Olok, Olok, I can only advise you by these are fundamental things. Don't put it off. That when I get time, I'll write it. No, no, no. You will write it. Write it. Start from tonight or start from tomorrow. And I do not. I, I do not have discipline like Ashok. You know, uh, Ashok has written. I, I probably have to sit down with Ashok how to write a book. I, I have not done that one. I spent a lot of time with him, but never spent the time how he how he wrote so many books. Um, because he doesn't yeah. do any work, yeah. so he writes. <laughs> <laughs> no, also, if you permit me, I'll tell you, Olog, you start anywhere and call it one chapter, chapter 9 or 10 or whatever. Then come okay. forward and go backward. Olog, also, am I wrong or am I uh, love, talking? Start from love? chapter 9 or 10. Yes, start from chapter that 9. Is, is, then come forward into the yeah. channel, backward integration. May I ask one question? Palit here. Yeah. 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 Okay, Alok, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear. I, I can see you also. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's the that, that's nice oh. thing about this, pro, the, the, yes, this, yes. this forum. Nice I can to, see you also. Nice to see you as well as uh, listen to you. Uh, I just wanted to make, it is not a question, it is a statement that when you speak English, so many times we say that, I mean, if you want to say it is simple, we say it is not a rocket science. So today I got a taste of why it is said so. By the little talk, it is just one hour talk, what you delivered, from that I can make out why this particular proverb or figure of speech came. That is number one. Lovely. And number two is, you mentioned Spalding and Patankar. I think you are talking of uh, Dr. Patankar, who also uh, spent a little time taught at IIT Kanpur. Yes. Am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes I yes, know yes. he was from Imperial College. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, then uh, I just want to say, I mean, uh, he was there for a very short time. I had the privilege of taking some course by Dr. Patankar, and it, he was an excellent teacher, great teacher, one of the great teachers I have ever met. Anyway, all the best. Uh, yes, you know, but, uh, very good. Uh, but, yeah, but. Uh, uh, I, I didn't have an opportunity to uh, work with Patankar, but I know him personally. Uh, I mean, he's an, he's amazing in everything what yeah. he does. You know, um, um, hats off to him. You know, yeah. and one thing he has done. You know, uh, talking about the book. You know, uh, Spalding never got a chance to write a book, but Patankar did that. So I think yeah. he did a great service by writing uh, that book of numerical heat transfer. Uh, which has been used by you know thousands of students across the university right. uh, across the world, and uh, because of his contribution, probably you know the uh, CFD has spread so much because of yeah. his book. And uh, and and he used to he used to um, have a, um, a course at ASME. And many, many university students used to come and take his course and offer the course in their universities. So this is how he, he I mean, his contribution goes in this way, that not only he taught many students, he taught many, uh, many professors how to teach um, um, CFD. And um, so, so, uh, so, yeah, I think he, um, he is a very, very respectable figure. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Just one more thing. And I can I make a query? Uh, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is? Should I, should I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you. Sudhi. Sudhi, yeah. you ask. Uh, Dr. Mohinder has seen NASA for over five, uh, I think, four or five decades. So, he has seen the transformation of NASA also. So, can you sir, uh, share uh, how NASA has transformed in its way of operation? Which, you know, space we just uh, used to see it as, uh, I mean, totally government thing. I mean, devoid of any involve, direct involvement of private party or startup. So, how NASA is now 
dealing with that is it now involving private parties even startup uh, more intimately uh, or yes. taking care of the IP things and uh, you no know, confidentiality because in india we find that it's more or less very private very close door thing uh well uh, let me let me first take your your first question about how and nasa has changed uh, and it has changed very significantly um uh, earlier you know the way it used to work you know nasa used to go to the congress and get money and nasa used to come up with a program and mm-hmm. then you know they needs to pick up the contractors and the, mostly the contractors used to do work I mean, nasa used to do work when uh, warner von brown was there because at that time uh, that uh, that uh, nasa used to do the parallel design with the contractors and they ultimately came up with, with the best design but after von brown was gone it was all contractors nasa used to only you know give contract and they used to oversee the work so there was really not much work was going on at nasa uh, now things have started changing now uh, but, uh, now and the, the commercial uh, program um, uh, have started so again the commercial program has started uh, with first with the nasa money uh, nasa has asked uh, spacex to to develop and the program but in but what happened uh, spacex uh, of course you know elon musk for i'm just giving one example um, he is putting so much of his um, own funding and also his insight he, he is a very smart person really he is not a rocket scientist but you know because his you know involvement with the tesla and his innovative nature entrepreneur uh, he, he came up entrepreneur and he came up with this idea i mean he used to give an example about this reusability of the rocket he used to say that you know uh, throwing the rocket you know after um, after the first stage it's like you know you you, you take a plane from uh, new york to uh, san francisco and you left the plane and you 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 develop another plane to come back you know mm-hmm. so, so this is how you know uh, the, the space philosophy was mm-hmm. going on and before elon musk so of course you know when you make a interplanetary journey of course you, you will have to uh, leave the plane you, i mean you, you have a rocket you cannot uh, get the rocket back from the moon you know uh, but but when you are for example when you are going to the space station uh, uh, of course you know we, uh, why it cannot be reused and that's what he has shown that you can reuse the rocket uh, just you know you, you carry a little bit of more fuel there and then you know after your um, core stage is done you just use the same rocket to come slowly and land it in the land and then you can reuse it so that is really a, a revolutionary uh, concept and uh, now spacex have gone so much you know into this and nasa has started saying that hey i'm going to give you the money and then you pick up um, engineers from nasa Uh, to work so now you know the the, the, the uh, if you have a space project the nasa engineers are working mode of operation working has... mode of operation has completely changed and which is going to the good direction you know the, why you know you keep you know 5000 people in a organization they will be only overseeing the work uh, so now they will have to do the work so definitely the productivity has significantly changed um, and going in the right direction and to uh, in in the in the space program so that that has that has definitely changed and i, I forgot sumit what was your um, uh, uh, issue, other other question uh, ipr issues come to uh, i mean is there any critical issues concerning ipr confidentiality oh I mean, yes private there private is confidentiality we have definitely um, in 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 the most of the work which we do for the rocket we really uh, cannot really publish those things um, uh, um uh, if you see that i did not show any any number of this what is the pressure and temperature in the space shuttle main engine i cannot show that one to you i can tell you how it works you know i can definitely you know um, use it in my class to explain the but i cannot simply tell you that you know what is the temperature of the nozzle at that time those things are very very confidential uh, so every uh, every uh, publication which which we do uh, it has to go through a review process and they will see that if any you know um, 
um, any critical information is uh, is not going out. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 there is the confidentiality is there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, NASA wants to help the um, ha help the um, universities. So that's the reason. You know, I can give my code uh, to, to, uh, to the uh, to, to, to the universities, but I cannot give and give the model. I can I can give the model. Huh? Uh, yeah. In fact, you know, one of the startup company you also encourage startups. Yes, your... yes, we encourage the startup. Uh, 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 let me tell you that it's a, it's an interesting question, and uh, I I wanted to bring that to you uh, guys, and that um, that that this code because the same thing being... we also happening nowadays with Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I think um, um, uh, um, I think it is eventually happen probably uh, everywhere. The commercialization will will, will come. Will come. Otherwise, you know, uh, just um, uh, you cannot really run an industry only with the taxpayers' money. It is not. It has to have a commercial value to to to, to, to survive. Um, uh, so I mean, it, it is going to just like you, for example, the aviation. Aviation started everything with the with the government money. If you go back hundred years back, so all the. Um, uh, uh, aviation research was done by the government, but now uh, b very little research has been done by the government. It's most of the research is yeah, done by Boeing, Lockheed. They're doing it because you know they 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 are competing. So the space is going to go in that direction. That, that, that's the direction it is going right now. Um, the other thing what I was going to tell you that uh, that uh, we have found a small company uh, who is uh, this code is is free to uh, for any government. Contract, but if is if they don't have a government contract, they they will have to get the code. So there is a mechanism to do that one. So NASA has given a company uh, a licensing to you know sell the code uh, to um, non-government entities. In fact, this code is being used uh, um, at um, um, at IIT Kharagpur. Their cryogenic lab, you know, they approached me and uh, can I get the code? But then I found that we can mm. give it free to the U.S. university, but we cannot give this code free uh, to the uh, to the universities around the world. That they will not okay. get them. Uh, so what I told uh, them that wh why didn't you contact this company? They can probably give you. Um, so because I know that person and uh, he gave them in a very little cost, um, maybe five thousand dollars or so, something like that. Uh, I think Kharagpur has a copy of the code. I think Bombay has a copy of the code. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, a graduate student is now working at UAH uh, who has started w working in this code and now he's working with us here. Uh, at, uh, uh, he, he got a you know, um, Fulbright scholarship and uh, has come to work with us. So he's working at UAH now, right now, on his PhD thesis. He's working on the you know, water hammer. So I it is possible I just, now. I, I just wanted to say one thing. Our ISRO is also selling selling technology uh, i don't know the details but islo has got a different branch he has made a different so he's not selling technology they are compartment and they are selling through that compartment separate vertical through that they are selling technology yes i know that okay uh, i i don't know whether nasa can sell the technology probably they cannot sell the technology um, and they uh, but they help the startups you know uh, if somebody wants to take nasa technology to you know uh, uh, for the further exploration they can do that one uh, but nasa really cannot sell the technology because nasa is based on taxpayers money uh, they, they cannot they, they they really cannot cannot sell the technology as far as i know uh, yes. but you know mm -hmm. Thank you. At the end, Chairman, please give me a couple of minutes for thanksgiving. Professor Monon, please. Is there any more queries, person? Okay, if not, then let us thank all of the usual way. Okay, Very course. nice. We enjoyed it. Thank well, uh, thank on behalf of the thank department, you. On behalf of the department and on behalf of the Centenary Celebration Committee, let me thank uh, 
Dr. Alok Mujindar, for his nice presentation and this, uh, I mean, it's, uh, this uh, journey through the space in a way, I should say. It's a very nice lecture. We learned a lot of things, and particularly looking at the things how NASA was doing all these things. As we have seen, mostly they, I mean, they had to depend on a lot of experiments in the early days. Maybe now once the simulation or the, uh, I mean, models are validated, you might be using more of you know models for recent work. But earlier, I mean, 70s and 80s, it was mostly you know experimental data that supported you in developing your models and moving forward. So I must thank the speaker. I must also take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Mondol for chairing the session and allowing us to discuss things. Thank you, Professor Mondol. Thank you, senior members of alumni. Professor Ghosh is there. Professor Mondik. Palit is also there. Dr. Bhatchaj also I have seen joining here. I don't know whether Devesda has joined. Devesda um, mentioned he might be joining. I'm not sure. Vidut, have you seen Devesda joining? It will be 3 a.m. for Devesh. He cannot yes, join. He has not. 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 Anyway, so, thank, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shudeep, uh, for yeah. arranging this. It is a very yeah, yes, nice opportunity. I have been able to see so, so many of old friends yes, this, here. Uh, uh, and, this and, memento as a token of appreciation and the certificate, the soft copy of the certificate will be sending to uh, email. And the hard copy we will be keeping for, uh, for the time being here. We will we have to send it to post or maybe we will find look for opportunity to hand it over when you are here in India sometime. So the, both okay. the memento and the hard copy will be keeping for some time. If we um, find somebody mm. here, then we will hand it over or we will arrange, we'll arrange. I, I, I really, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. And um, uh, really look, this has become an evening Adda <laughs> session for all the old people, seventy-five plus. <laughs> they don't have any. No, I, I thought they of, come for I this Adda getting, session. Yeah, I, I, wish, I, I, I wish, wish I could please, join, but, but because because of my uh, this is a work time, I cannot join ah. it. But I'll try to you know watch it onto the onto the YouTube. I, I know that most of the lectures are in the YouTube. I am. Planning to do that one. I thought of reaching out to Dr. Kishori Mahon Kundu, uh, <laughs> but I missed. Uh, I didn't get his number. Uh, oh, if okay. I could get him, then he could also get, get your old uh, old colleague and old friend here. Yeah, if yeah, you, you, get, the other day you if are mentioning you, if you uh, get, his, get his email and Dr. Dr. Fadri. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Fadri passed uh, away. Do you have his email Yeah, Dr. Fadri also yes, he has passed away. Uh, he is also from that. I don't. I'm not sure whether uh, he's a contemporary of uh, Dr. Pal, uh, Pandapal or not. Maybe. Uh, uh, close. I don't remember Dr. Bhaduri. I know that Dr. Bhaduri um, um, it was in the centenary year in 1957. He graduated. He's a 57 batch, Dr. Bhaduri. But I don't remember uh, when Dr. Pandapal graduated. Pandapal was senior. Yeah. Uh, senior than Dr. Bhaduri. Pandapal was 53. Dr. Pandapal was our teacher as well. He was our yeah. teacher as well. Mm. Dr. Pandapal was my supervisor, um, uh, uh, Amy, and I also uh, had his heat transfer class because he offered the heat transfer class as elective uh, in, in in the fifth year. Was Pandapal or D.N. Roy? Uh, no, Dr. Pandapal offered the heat transfer class. I took the Dr. Pandapal's class. I think oh. I think Dr. Dean Raposa probably used to it in in, in masters, but in the undergraduate uh, he transfer uh, Dr. Paul. Yeah, uh, offered that. Dr. Dean is dead. He must be aware. He was in Kolani. He used to stay in Kolani. Um, oh. He's dead now. Dr. Pannapal is also. I don't know about Dr. Professor Pannapal. Yeah. Pannapal uh, is no more. Hmm. Uh, we lost one because the Paul, I think, uh, seven, eight years back. I see. 
So, Dr. Mojundo, it will be better if you visit our department whenever you come to India. Sometimes. Definitely, definitely, I'll, uh, I'll do that one. Uh, because when I go, I go, I go to Ashok's place. So, you know, I'll yeah. I'll go with Ashok. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. Do drop in. Very close to us. Thank you, thank you, boy. Okay, so with thank that, you. Uh, I think uh, we will stop here for today. So, uh, in the next uh, week, there is also another lecture, hopefully. So you are requested to join yes. that.